It's a very great pleasure to re-welcome Jean-Louis Cohen, uh, who's going to give a, a lecture on the topic of the Casablanca um, experiment. Um, and I should say, in addition to, he's managed to fit in, in his visit uh, to give this lecture, to give a seminar uh, tomorrow at 11.30. Um, so please do feel invited, in addition to the History and Theory uh, MA, to that. Um, obviously, the, the term, let alone the name, kind of Casablanca, has an enormous number of suggestions. Um, between 1912 and 56, Casablanca was under French rule. Um, and a kind of quasi-obscure Mediterranean port was transformed into a kind of turbulent metropolis. Um, a metropolis which, in some sense, embodied all Mediterranean cultures. At the same time, its metamorphosis uh, coincided with a series of experiments in urbanism, in housing and public architecture. As a consequence, architects and clients shaped one of the overlooked scenes of modernity, addressing issues such as the interpretation of the built tradition in new forms of housing or the provisions for a pragmatic yet controlled urban development in Casablanca. Jean-Louis Cohen is uh, well known at the AA and we're very grateful that he's come back to speak. He is an architect, he's a historian, he specializes in European and American urbanism and the architecture of the 20th century. He's professor at New NYU's Institute of Fine Art, and now he is director, I think, of the Institut Français d'Architecture, and he's in charge of developing the Cité de l'Architecture et du Patrimoine, uh, which is a new Paris public project. He's the author of many books. Uh, they include Le Corbusier, and the mystique of the USSR, of Mies van der Rohe, uh, of a book entitled The Scenes of the World to Come, and now of Casablanca, Mite Figure de l'Aventure Urbaine, published in 1998. It's a great pleasure to welcome Jean-Louis Cohen. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, Mark. It's also for me a great uh, uh, pleasure and a great nostalgia to be in this place. I remember uh, hours of lectures and seminars uh, back in the beginning in the mid-70s with uh, Alvin somewhere upstairs and Robin Middleton passing by with a new castle in his hand and never listening to the lectures of people he had invited. So I'm happy that you're sitting on the... <laughs> first uh, row this, uh, today. Uh, good. Uh, may I have the first two slides because uh, perhaps we need a sort of uh, visual uh, introduction to this story. The story we'll tell is the story of a city which is often overlooked um, by tourists and completely overlooked by most architectural historians and yet an extremely interesting um, and perhaps more than that, fascinating and an indispensable city in the discussion of 20th century architecture. A city also, also which raises issues of, about uh, ethnicity, about uh, politics, about class, uh, and as you can see from these first slides, about uh, architectural form from the early interpretation of Islamic shapes in the 1920s to perhaps the most daring 
uh, with Miami Beach, of course, the most daring scene of 1950s formalism. So, in short, a very intriguing city on which nothing serious had been written until a certain summer of 1989. So let me be slightly autobiographical. Uh, why did I, and not alone, with, together with my wife and colleague Monique Elab, who is a native from Casablanca, but mostly known for being a scholar of uh, domestic architecture and domestic space. She has published many books on that topic, both historical and current. So suddenly, we, in the summer of 80, uh, 1989, we started mm -hmm. making photographs and taking notes. And in fact, we suddenly realized that we had not decided to make a book, but that a book had decided to be made by us. Uh, that the book was slowly taking shape as we were beginning to uh, forget the dirty uh, sidewalks somewhere here and the derelict uh, lower stories of the building to look up, to look to uh, these uh, very exciting buildings. So we suddenly, or not suddenly, we realized that what had taken place in Casablanca during, let's say, 50 years or 60 years was uh, an, an extremely interesting condensate of 20th century architecture and urbanism, and in a very conflictual zone, in a very conflictual part of the planet. So we started, uh, as, as, uh, if we look at the Casablanca, at the, yes, uh, sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to handle this properly. So we started with the discovery of extremely daring buildings. This one is a building by uh, Marius Boyer, built in uh, 1928 for a wealthy Jewish family. So we suddenly realized that uh, Casablanca was not simply a city which had been present in fiction in the movies, of course, as you know, but a city which had been the theater of an extremely daring, of an extremely uh, ambitious uh, architectural adventure uh, represented by buildings which were unthinkable at the same time in Paris, the Paris urban code would never have allowed su such eccentricities. Um, we realized that from the building to the uh, decoration, an extremely uh, powerful uh, a project had been developed, a project uh, that took place in a city which grew uh, between 1907, when the French landed there. 1907, the French Navy bombs and lands in Casablanca. 1958 or 56, more or less, when Morocco becomes independent, we see the extension of the city in white, the Muslim areas of the city. Muslim and Jews here, Muslim and Jews there, many uh, more Muslims and less and more Jews, but proportionally, the proportion is changed in the 50s. We see how a small city grows into a metropolis in a, according to a series of plans and extremely interesting architectural uh, ventures. So what can you do in a city when you, ha you have no continuous building records? In a city where you have no continuous runs of magazines, where history is half lost, uh, you start investigating, you start finding some uh, piecemeal issues of magazines, 10 issues of a magazine published between 32 and 33, uh, five issues of another aborted magazine, uh, some issues of l'architecture d'aujourd'hui, one article in Architectural Association's quarter quarterly in 1954, you find some very small uh, pieces. And then uh, you realize that you have to go to the basics, that you have to go and work in dusty archives to uh, get your work done. So you work in the dusty archives and you find uh, lists, endless lists of building permits. This is the register of building permits on the left, you find sometimes microfilmed, uh, microfilmed uh, bu also building permits that give you an idea of who built a building. One very simple uh, problem, sorry to let, uh, let you into the kitchen, but uh, one, uh, when you, you, you're writing a history of Canterbury Paris or Canterbury London, there are building records, you know more or less who has built what, when, for whom. We had to reconstruct in order to reach that long-term goal uh, doing a book which was published in 1998, as Mark said, and will be published by Monacelli Press in New York in the summer of 2000. 
uh, fat 500 pages book. So in order to go from no knowledge at all and no organized uh, facts to a book, you have to do extremely boring, unglamorous things, si spending long sunny afternoons uh, eating dust, uh, bringing your, your own pocket lamp or your own bulbs because the bulbs of the archival room have, have been stolen. So, uh, I mean, doing research in these conditions is extremely difficult, not to mention the bribes you have to pay or to refuse to pay, which uh, extends the, the duration of your research extremely. Uh, so, uh, uh, work had to be done in the archives. Work had to be done also uh, in the, on the ground. So, we investigated in order to understand what had happened in, in Casablanca. Uh, we had to investigate from the bourgeois families which would not let us initially into their houses, we'll see some of these, some of these later, to the uh, uh, working class uh, um, uh, schemes where, people, uh, where workers had been housed by the industrial uh, firms uh, back in the 30s and we, ha we had to follow a series of trails. We had also uh, to uh, work on uh, a series of other representations. Here one example. We see the American French singer Josephine Baker singing in front of the American troops. So we had, uh, and this was my contribution in particular, we had to work in uh, absolutely unexpected archives. For instance, this is a, a still picture from the US Army archives in Washington where you can re literally find millions of images of every, everything that happened during World War II. So this is shortly after the landing in Casablanca in 1942, and you have millions of photographs. You would find also photographs of almost every uh, country where war had taken place. Uh, we see here uh, now the evidence of the first fact we had to deal with when we, uh, when we started working on the project. The fact that the city of Casablanca and its history became the focus of what I would call a mythical production. Casablanca, of course, is a myth in terms of the movies uh, because of a particular uh, movie made in 1942 by Michael uh, Curtis with, as you know, uh, Bogart and Ingrid Bergman, a film which is about romance and not about a city a film which was also shot with a certain knowledge of the city, although it locates Casablanca in the desert. Casablanca is not on the Mediterranean, as Mark has said, but on the Atlantic. Uh, but it's also not in the desert. It is on a very fertile uh, coastal plain. Uh, but before that, uh, before uh, the hijacking of the city by Hollywood, the French had started staging Casablanca. On the left, one of the most popular novels of the 1920s called Les Hommes Nouveaux, New Man, telling the history of a man on the right, a colon who comes to uh, the city to make money uh, through real estate development. So the city was already a sort of epitome of of economic energy of urban development. As you see on the right on this, the cover of this brochure, the ci cities that grow, cities that grow, Casablanca was considered as a sort of mushrooming city, the term I guess was first used in the French context for that city, a mushrooming city similar to a sort of capital of a French far west. The term was coined by French officials who were looking at America at that time, like General Lyotet, who would be the first resident general of France. He was seeing in Morocco, which, by the way, he is more or less at the latitude of California. One thing Casablanca shares with Los Angeles is the being on the same uh, parallel. So uh, what we see here is in this literary cinematographic and uh, uh, what, I would, uh, what I would say, what I would call ad advertising uh, 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 extension and, and reflection of the city, uh, really the presence of something new in a tight France before 1914, fighting for, its, for hegemony on the continent with Germany, Morocco appears as a, as a sort of test ground of modernization, that is of real change of society and not yet of modernity. This is something we'll see later. Uh, here we see, uh, yes, on the, uh, 
on the left and right, we see how was the city when the French landed. This is a 1907 map. It shows you a very small uh, town, 30,000 inhabitants, which had no particular monumental feature. Casablanca is a latecomer on the American scene, not like Fez or Marrakesh. The first city had existed in the Middle Ages, Middle Ages and had been burned by the Portuguese around 1500. You see a small city divided into a Muslim area, a Jewish area, which was extremely densely populated. The Jews were very influent in Morocco before colonization, and many came from the, the coastal cities to Casablanca to participate to a development which had started already before French landing. So the French construct a myth, and the myth is that the city, you see a typical view in 1910, that the city was a sort of sleepy oriental beauty uh, with one, uh, uh, one uh, s s footnote that it was not beautiful. So it was a sleeping, ugly uh, Muslim city which was waiting for French energy to be awakened. So Casablanca was founded, uh, the, the, um, had been founded for medieval trade. The city was refounded in the 19th century and in a way was discovered by Europe w at the time of the 1907 land landing as a theater of urban growth uh, at a time, and this is very important, in which the media uh, were really uh, interested on a daily basis into the colonial ex uh, adventures. So, uh, together with the first group of French soldiers, uh, Lumiere Brothers movie cameraman landed and shot the transformation of the city. The city was doubly shot, if I may say so. So, this city became very quickly a very important place for colonization, and this drew hundreds of thousands of uh, French, uh, Spaniards, uh, Italians, Greeks, etc., to the city. Here we see. Uh, one of our first surprises in looking at the city. Uh, although founded by the French and densely populated by French migrants, the city remained extremely diverse in its, uh, in its substance. Other social and uh, national and ethnic groups found their way. So if we look at the uh, way the Muslims were housed, we find a very wide range of participation of Muslim investors into the making of a city. This is a big Art Deco house built by Boyer, the major architect in the 20s and 30s, for the great vizier of the Moroccan king, El Mokri, a house which has been destroyed, but which was a sort of gigantic Art Deco palace with, and I will return to this, medieval uh, Moroccan uh, ornaments. We find for El Glawi. El Glawi was the ruler of southern Morocco, was the regional boss of Marrakesh, and was really a very important slave trader, and uh, at the same time a seducer who uh, was uh, uh, hosting parties and, and having a very dense, uh, uh, what I would say, sentimental uh, life with European women. El Glawi built and invested in having the same boyer built an extremely important building in the center of the city and with a shopping arcade. This is another shopping arcade being in, built in the 1920s for Tazi, yet another Moroccan ruler. At the other end of the scale, of the social scale, Casablanca, and this is a remark I would, do, I would make on colonial planning, on, the, on studies that are made on colonial city. Very, very frequently, these studies uh, under um, in a way underestimate uh, or underscore the class dimension of the, in the division of space. Space in Casablanca was not simply divided into French, Muslim and Jewish quarters but also into bourgeois and working class quarters. So we see here the lower uh, Muslim uh, employees, uh, areas which are built south of the, the center. I will explain this later. And we see on the left, so Muslim housing in the 30s, and we see the very fast development, the, the original Medina is here, of the shanties. The term bidonville, which uh, denotes a city 
uh, made of drums, of oil dr flattened oil drums, the term bidonville, which could later use be used throughout the French Empire and also at home, is first coined in Casablanca to describe one of these shanties. So the city has an, ex an unexpected success and remain a city of many classes and social groups. If we look now at the Jews, the Jews had uh, lived in a particular area of the city and here we see one of these uh, a part of the Mela in the, of the traditional Ju Jews in Morocco were not confined in ghettos but they used to live in specific parts of the city called uh, Mellas and here you see this part in Casablanca the difference with the Muslim houses of course are to be seen with the windows here we see the early uh, the early houses built by Jews after the colonization. What happened with the Jews is a very interesting phenomenon. Here we see the first horizontal extension of the Jewish uh, neighborhoods. Here we see one of the most important uh, f Jewish families, the f a family that will give a lot of land to the, uh, for colonization, uh, building its house, the Benazeraf Bin house of 1930. Uh, sorry. Here we see uh, on the left uh, once again the Levi Bendaon house. What happened with these houses is that the Jews, first of all, flocked to Casablanca to take part to, the, to economic development as investors or are, uh, as labor. The first thing is that the second thing is that according to the former Muslim law, the Jews were not allowed to build houses higher than the Muslims were not supposed to, to build uh, synagogues which were higher than the mosques. So uh, they were not allowed to own land outside their own house, but they had collected a lot of debt from the Muslim feudal families and so I had a lot of uh, real estate uh, titles of ownership. So as soon as the French in a way broke the, mus the, the previous pre-colonial law, the Jews became the major landlords in the city so we're major players in real estate and we're also the ones who wanted to have the highest and most modern houses and this, explain, this explains why most owners of the high-rise buildings such as this one, the Levi Bendayan house by Boyer, were Jews. They wanted to be visible, they wanted to be prominent, they wanted to be visible, they wanted to be modern. So this is the plan on the right of this house is extremely interesting because it, we see the open courtyard here and more, the central staircase. It's a house, house which develops extremely innovative uh, principles of distribution based on the notion that on hygienic ideas, on an aesthetic which is absolutely no longer the late Haussmannian one. So Jews were extremely visible and would be visible until the 1950s in various terms in, uh, this is a view of Casablanca in the 50s with the Medina in the back here, the harbor. The plan by Michel Ecochard for that moment, the old Medina, creating a very big uh, new housing development. And you see here on the seashore, the sea is here, houses which were specifically built for, for uh, poor Jews, for the poorest Jews. So what is interesting in Casablanca is that un until the uh, and I will return later to the housing for the poorest Muslims. So you had, uh, you had policies that were dealing with the specific groups of the population in these terms and so often, as we shall see, in rather innovative terms. Other aspects of the Casablanca experiment, and this is where I come to my title, what uh, we found out in working on the city is that in fact the Casablanca, the, the city became a sort of laboratory where experiments were made. That is where uh, solutions were sold to problems uh, in terms of urbanism. How uh, can a plan deal with individual processes of production of houses in terms of construction and also in terms of adaptation of uh, general principles of architecture to local situations. So here we see one of the first, the first major building of a new town uh, the f and here once again I would challenge an accepted view on, on colonial issues which is what I would call the Fou Fou Foucault strategy, uh, the Foucault interpretation. Michel Foucault has very aptly and very intelligently and I respect him a lot uh, since uh, 
the 1960s, when I first read his early books, uh, Foucault uh, had discussed of a lot as connected space and power. But, and, and often writers on colonial planning have seen essentially issues of power. But one tends to forget that the, the real issue about colonization is not, to, is not to exert power, but to make money. Is really to, to trade, to make money, to create the terms of an, an unequal exchange. And that the soldiers as, are there to serve and to protect the merchants. Uh, so the first gesture of the French in Casablanca after the military keep control, keep the city quiet, is to open a department store to trade. And this department store is built by one architect called De La Porte and by a concrete consultant whose name is Auguste Perret. So Perret is the, the founder of the French ap approach and I would say of the modern approach to reinforce concrete is there in 1913 and works as a consultant for this gal later call, building later called the Galerie Lafayette. Perret also built, uh, what happens? I have a problem here with my, have a belated, s sorry. Okay. The system is too complex for me. Okay, I have a missing slide. Anyway, we see uh, here, um, Another contribution of Perret to the making of Casablanca, which is very important, the, one of the first, uh, perhaps the first uh, shallow vault building, a building with a three, three millimeter vault. It's a bit exaggerated here graphically, which is built as a warehouse for an industrialist. So we see how firms that are looking for fields of innovation, also in terms of constructions, are looking eagerly and watching eagerly what, what is happening in Casablanca. In the 1920s, innovation will become typological. So here we see one of the most interesting new buildings built by Marius Boyer, the architect I've already mentioned. Boyer, in 1930, built this Asayag house uh, the house is built once again for a Jewish investor and is a high-rise setback tower which was absolutely unthinkable in Paris. It is in fact the best embodiment of the ideas of Henri Sauvage, the setback terraced house by Sauvage are not built in Paris or only very modestly. They are built in Casablanca by someone like Boyer uh, once again for a, a developer who wants to be uh, uh, visible. So here we see the plan of, uh, of the houses. We see on the left uh, a penthouse on the top and a very, in fact, a very interesting system of residence. We see the plan here, these three flower-shaped plans and then in the back uh, um, uh, half, another half of a building with an underground garage. So uh, typological innovation is really very developed in uh, Casablanca as, and is a major feature Another major feature uh, in the 50s is, again, a return to technological experiments. This is a prefab uh, lightweight concrete building built by the Honegger brothers from Geneva. The Honeggers were architects and builders in Geneva. One of them was the treasurer of the SIAM, of the International Congresses for Modern Architecture, by the way. And they, like Perret in 1913, at the end of the 1940s, at a time of the second golden age of Casablanca, built extremely innovative, lightweight concrete buildings, which were absolutely ahead of what was made in, uh, other part in, in Europe at that time. Another aspect which is really... Uh, inter oh, I have problems with some slides that don't fall down. I'm, I'm, I don't know what's happening. Is someone uh, running the... No? The projection? No, nobody. Okay. Because there are slides that don't show us. This one is correct. Let me return. Okay, no. This is fine. So what do I get now? I missed a slide on the right. No, or oh, I missed a slide. Okay, forget it. I will try to. I will try to survive. I will tell you when I I, I find a very difficult problem. Another uh, uh, strategy of innovation in Casablanca was. Uh, uh, innovation in terms of comf comfort. We see here uh, the electric kitchen 
of the bourgeois villa of the 1930s. In, if you take the, as a criterion of, of modernization and not of modernism, of course, the number of bathrooms per uh, inhabitant in a city, Casablanca was ahead of all French cities, including Paris, in the mid-30s, uh, taking account similar social classes. So in a way, the colonization was both a space of freedom for architects and builders and a space of uh, more rapid access to modernization. This was also true of the Muslim families. And uh, here, uh, this would be true also in the, 19, um, in the 1950s. And here we see the plan for a young uh, couples housing scheme in the 50s where such uh, a, f a very interesting free plan. You can see also, look at the graphic expression, which is rather funny. This was built in the 50s for young couples uh, in a specifically identified building. So specialized programs for singles or couples were made from the 20s to the 50s and they were very often open to new concept of space and comfort. What is interesting is that these uh, changes are not completely uh, reserved to the um, Europeans, and that we see uh, very interesting hybrids. Uh, hybridization is, of course, a very important term in the Casablanca experiment. Uh, introducing Islamic themes or themes uh, uh, distilled, I would say, from the Moroccan tradition. I traditions, Morocco is a diver very diverse country. Jews, Muslim, Arabs, Berbers, north, south, east, west, uh, coast, mountains, etc. So taking, uh, it's extremely diverse. So when I say Moroccan, it's an oversimplification by many aspects. What we see here is the contrast between in, in a house built for wealthy merchant families in the, the early 30s between a, a modernized exterior, which is halfway between the cubic houses of pre-colonial Casablanca and Adolf Loos, and at the same time, the reproduction of the traditional patio of the house with, this is later furniture, but this is original. The, everything that's on the wall is original. The furniture is new. But what you see is this, these attempts at creating a, a sort of a traditional retreats in a city which is visibly on the outside modern. Another surprise, and I will end with the surprises and go to other issues, another very important factor is that in colonizing Casablanca and in colonial Casablanca, French and Moroccans were not alone. Others were there, uh, Germans. They were quickly kicked out, but nonetheless played a role. Um, there were Italians, Greeks, uh, Russians, etc., Spaniards, very many of them, and Americans. Uh, Americans were attracted to Casablanca in a way as one of the places where uh, it rolling back French influence in Africa was perhaps possible. And this is one of the reasons of their presence even before the 1942 landing, famous Operation Torch, which started, was a major turning point in the war. So we see here, shortly after the landing, gen two generals, Clark here and Patton, at a, a, a strategic uh, corner crossroad of Casablanca. Extremely modern buildings of the 30s can be seen. Here we see the, the a typical scene which might be, might be set in Hollywood, but is Casablanca in 1953. So the, the presence of American ideals, but also an, of American goods and of, of Americans uh, in the uh, 40s and 50s was, was extremely uh, important. So now let's look very, very quickly. Uh, I, I, I promised Mark to not to be over time by one week, so um, I will try to be quick, and I send you back to the book uh, if you want to know more. So Casablanca starts as a sort of far west city, and you can see this on the left. This is the where real estate was traded in uh, around 1912. So you see plans for subdivisions on the walls, and all the trade took place at the Café du Commerce next door drinking a pastis. So the city really developed with e incredible adventurers, people who were really uh, uh, characters of adventure films. And you see the first, perhaps you can guess what the first plan is. The first plan is a military plan, military inspired plan with a new boulevard circling the city, barracks blocking the extension to the south, 
and new blocks, and here a very small star-shaped new neighborhood. This is 1912, and a very modest and inadequate plan. The, the very important plan for Casablanca is the one that is made in 19, uh, between 15 and 1917 by perhaps the person who was the most important French planner in the first half of the century, a man called Prost, Henri Prost, <coughs> P-O-R-S-T. He had a Prix de Rome architect who had worked in, in uh, Istanbul to measure the Hagia Sophia Mosque. Prost comes and creates a plan which is very interesting. It's the essence of what I call pragmatic urbanism. It's not the new city. The city is entirely new with the exception of the Medina. But Prost doesn't make Chandigarh or Brasilia. There is not, no preconceived design, no grand composition, be it modern. There is instead a very careful negotiation which was what is going on in terms of real estate which with, with the way in which the site can work, Prost creates new boulevards, re-articulates existing streets, uh, deals with Lyotet and the military to extract the camps from the place they were here, to put them on the east, and therefore create a network of public spaces. So we see all the ideas that are developed in the circles of Tony Garnier, in the circles of Léon Josely, also at that time in France, uh, developed and we see a very, and I won't bore you with ur urbanism uh, issues, which might be uh, an entire uh, year long of lectures, uh, but uh, what Prost uses also, and this is very, in fact, very strange given the French German hostility, is the German technique of zoning. At that time, functional zoning is not used in France and will never be used until the 1930s. But thanks to uh, General Lyotet, who was the governing officer, who has a very broad idea of Morocco as a test bed for transforming the French elite. Lyotet collects sociologists, anthropologists, Islamologists, and also urbanists, all people in ists, to work on according to new guidelines. There, the motto is, do not follow French practice, but try to grasp from America, from Germany, what is good, what is what will have a, a perspective development and implement it. So the, the zoning, the, the urban law is ahead of by 20 or 30 years in respect to France. And this is what will allow Prost to re-articulate a city. An ill-born uh, city uh, will be transformed into a more a harmonious one. This is what the propaganda says. Prost works on redefining urban spaces. One is the relationship between the center and the, the harbor, the new harbor which is developed, the department store I've shown, the Medina, and here the new harbor. So there is one new boulevard called by him the Canebière of Casablanca in relationship to Marseille. He also works on a new urban square and in fact designs the city according to the, to the principles of Camillo Zitte, which have been published in, Fra in French at the beginning of the century through a differentiation of, of squares. Zitte discusses the differentiation of market square and town hall square in medieval cities. The market will be here, the town hall is there with buildings that uh, in fact recycle initially Venetian themes and will again become much more, uh, uh, much more neo-Moroccan. We see here the, uh, one of these buildings, the town hall as designed and as built by Boyer again an American parade, and we see what is perhaps a detail of what is perhaps the best uh, and most interesting buildings on the square, the post office. A white cube with uh, what you see here for the first time in this lecture, which is with the use, the very creative use of traditional American tiles called zillage. So what is interesting is here the, uh, in what is modern urbanism, I mean public Public space as we know it here was not known in, in, uh, in there were open spaces and, and market squares in, in Moroccan cities. But uh, public space is developed using languages that connect this architecture with, uh, with Moroccan uh, tradition. Prost also works on other uh, urban uh, uh, units in particular developing the concept of the parkway, a concept which had been born in the US 
and had been uh, introduced into French culture by Forestier, a garden architect who was one of the mentors of Prost. So we see uh, in relationship with local cultures, in relationship also with remote ideas about city planning, how Casablanca blends uh, previous experiments. Prost will extend the Prost ideas will extend. This is a view of a later plan in the 30s. We see but also always the same ideas, the same zoning, uh, residential areas in the west, commercial areas here, and industry in the east, and all, always the small white Medina here. What we see in yellow is the new Medina which is developing. On the right we see the unimplemented extension towards the sea for the city. Around 1930, uh, and I return to the American uh, reference, uh, some uh, French rulers say, okay, this is the capital of the French Far West, of French California, a liter literal quote. But this uh, new um, French California on North African soil needs a New York. It needs skyscrapers. And so designs for sky skyscrapers for a vertical city located here are made in order to show that uh, a new type of empire was taking shape. So we see here projects, two projects by Boyer. Are we at a turning point of our urbanism? And we see here a uh, design which has some features that are derived from the, the Ville Contemporaine by Le Corbusier or the Plan Voisin. The worst feature, that is the impossible air, airfield, e much worse than the former uh, Hong Kong airport. Uh, this one is really uh, catastrophe prone uh, airport. Anyway, we see that very quickly we are here uh, less than 20 years uh, after the, the, the official colonization, a uh, little more than 20 years, let's say, after the French landing, and the city has gone from 30 to 215,000 inhabitants. So it's really a sort of phenomenal urban success story, which can, of course, only be compared to American cities. I'm trying to be quick. Uh, in the 40s, uh, new plans introduce new features such as motorways and extend the notion of a vertical area, uh, of a vertical neighborhood. But the major plan, and this is a major, uh, a, a very important moment in uh, uh, the history of architecture and urban planning uh, uh, after World War II, takes place when a new planner is appointed in 46. This planner is Michel Ecochard. Ecochard is a functionalist planner who has, who, uh, like Prost, knows the Orient. He has worked in Damascus and Beirut. And Ecochard is the first to work on the notion that even if the, cit the city is colonial, it's a city where the Muslims are really, the Muslim working class is really mistreated. So here he shows how, look at these drawings, they show you the relative incidence of the uh, Muslim population in black and the European population in, um, in uh, gray. In black, in fact, the Jews are included. So we see that in 1950, the Moroccans altogether, Muslim and Jew, are three times as many as the Europeans, but that they occupy uh, much less space in the city. And if the density is compared, if, if no, what we see on the right is the, the quantity of space necessary to more or less uh, even the conditions, and we see how uh, difficult this, this would be. So Ecochard takes into account seriously the question of um, uh, housing the poor and develops a new concept, which is the concept of a regional city, once again the Medina, extending on the seashore in parallel, uh, uh, in parallel stripes, a little like the linear city of Milutin, which Ecochard knew. So we have a linear city pattern, industry, housing, uh, and um, uh, uh, gardens, a concept which had been or already developed by Le Corbusier from Milutin and which serves to re-articulate the entire, the entire city. So in fact, a very important move with Ecochard in the early 50s. Uh, what happens is that Ecochard inscribed his work in, in, in this tradition of dealing, which has, which has been, uh, uh, been uh, open by, uh, by the, colo the, the French uh, colonization in the 20s, of dealing in a creative way with the housing of the urban poor. 
So here we see, for instance, uh, the first uh, blocks of the new indigenous, the new uh, native town, as the colonialists used to say, the new Moroccan town, which is based on a thorough stud study of traditional housing, traditional courtyard housing, and it's so well reproduced in this model new Medina that today's, uh, that today's uh, Casablanca uh, inhabitants believe sincerely that this predated colonization. So we see here streets in this new neighborhood created in uh, beginning in 1918, which was the new uh, uh, Moroccan commercial and housing uh, uh, neighborhood, uh, initially designed for, for the poor and later uh, occupied by, by bourgeois families. We see here at the lower end of a social scale also how the enclosed space of, a, of the traditional Medina was recycled uh, in order to build worker settlements. In the 1940s, and all these uh, uh, approaches become very uh, insufficient and uh, the lo local public authorities, that is the French authorities, decide to create new types uh, of settlements at a new scale. This is here the Einschock New Medina, which has a center with public buildings and very interesting patio uh, semi-collective uh, houses. This is a, uh, built by an architect called Marquisio in 1946 and there is a funny American article which calls this uh, Medinet. Medinet, using a French suffix. Uh, we see here part of uh, one of the public buildings with a very successful imitation of the space of the traditional souks by uh, Busutil. But everything will change with Ecosha once again. In the basic plan for uh, Casablanca, Ecosha will create a sort of a new extensive grid. Look on the right, you see the extension of the shanties of the bidonville in the 50s. 150,000 inhabitants, Americans were living in shanties. So the idea is not to drop the shanty, but to study the shanty, to not to drop it altogether as unhealthy. And this is another of the Casablanca experiments, studying the way the poor Muslims live in, uh, and study their cultural models, their habits, and not dismiss it as unhealthy, but try to make it healthy. Uh, Ecosh, the, the team of Ecosha wa was perhaps for the first time in this context a team with sociologists, anthropologists, economists and they took seriously into account the fact that people could not afford modern housing so they created grid patio houses which were uh, built on a grid of 8 by 8 meters with the idea that you can see on the left of improving the bidonville, improving the shanty with these 8 by 8 eight patio houses at ground floor and then in a way paving the way to collective housing which was what everybody uh, also among the Muslim was waiting for. So uh, the representatives of the Muslim were saying why do you give us patio houses? We want also to have access to modern housing. This is also a case study of why uh, the uh, high-rise uh, towers and slabs became, uh, were at the time, uh, in a way, very popular. Uh, so here we see another issue which was very important, which was the creation of uh, neighborhood units based after, uh, in particular after English models or Swedish models, uh, in order to articulate uh, uh, ground level uh, one story houses and collective houses. So a very massive experiment was made taking into account once again uh, the, the habit of Muslim families to, to live around the patio to cook in the outdoors. And what is extremely interesting is to see how these ideas were introduced into collective uh, schemes by the team of Adbat in 1952. Adbat was a consulting team uh, created by Le Corbusier and headed by the engineer Vladimir Bodiansky to build the Marseille housing block. After the end of a uh, site in Marseille, Adbat developed its activity in North Africa headed by a uh, Greek architect uh, Georges Candilis. Uh, and we see here one of the two 
uh, more spectacular buildings built by Candilis and Shadrach Woods with the help of a young British architect called Brian Richards who still lives in this city. Uh, what we see in black here are just uh, forgotten uh, uh, trenchers to put electricity. So the, 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 the wiring had to be made after painting the building. And what we see is here the relationship with the Berber houses in the south. Uh, in the 50s, uh, what becomes the focus, the center for inspiration is no longer the Islamic decoration, no longer the tiles, no longer all these superficial elements, but rather the volumetric organization, uh, the pyramid-shaped uh, settlements often built in adobe that Berbers had built since the Middle Ages and before in the Atlas Mountains. So we see, and here for instance, Candilis, who was able of justifying anything, but justified the narrow steps, not these ones, but others by saying these are the same, they are the, sa the same steps that the one we find in the mountains. So we find a very interesting here uh, strategy, which is once again an experiment on, specif on specificity. The the, the, this building on the left is called uh, Semiramis, a uh, game, uh, a play of word on semi uh, duplex or, or on this, what I would say, the, the, the suspended gardens of Babylon and also the fact that, that you have a semi level here. Uh, and here, this other project, which is perhaps a uh, building which is perhaps uh, better known, is called Honeycomb, Nida Bay. And we see it published on the cover of L'Architecture d'Aujourd'hui uh, as an extraordinary, I, and I find, find here a very, an extraordinary icon, the post-war Corbusian uh, colors uh, are organized in a sort of Mondrian-esque fashion on a building which in, in fact is sup superimposed traditional patio housing. What you see here is an and closed patio, patios with, with the wall but with an open uh, courtyard that are piled up. So it's an extremely interesting uh, response uh, which tries to mediate between the unité d'habitation verticality and with, with, uh, with the, grid, the horizontal grid of Ecochard. Uh, and, uh, so, and this building is, uh, will be or has been very important in a series of exchanges that take place in the 1950s when the team, the uh, CIAM, the International Congress for Modern Architecture, uh, meet in Aix-en-Provence in 1952, the Moroccan groups, the Moroccan group with Ecosha and Candilis have a uh, fantastic success with their exhibition of horizontal grids and also vertical housing. Uh, as Alison Smithson would later say, this, w this was the eye opener for opener for our group, the group that will later create a uh, Team 10. So in 1955, for instance, there is an issue of architectural design where this new housing is hailed as the first attempt at changing housing since the unité d'habitation, as a fir first attempt at work in terms of specificity. And the Smithsons includes also views of, uh, of casbahs uh, such as these in their, in their article. So this is also a very important moment in which, in fact, what has been performed by Candilis and his group appears as a really experimental strategy. Here we see, uh, and now I think I have to uh, uh, s quickly or, or, or uh, drift towards an end of this lecture, but I want to uh, give you an idea also of the purely architectural uh, attempts that took place in Casablanca and you'll see that the, the spectrum, I would say the, the architectural zoo there is full of, of extremely uh, exciting animals. So this is for instance an attempt to build at, the, at urban scale one building equals one block. It's a building built for an insurance company around 1930 by an architect called Grelin. What we see here is also the connection between this building and the surrounding ones, perhaps difficult to grasp, to grasp, but one of the qualities of the plan by Prost, and this is also what I call pragmatic urbanism, was not to make any uh, unified composition for the, for the streets, but rather to give incentives and to create sort a system of rules that would unify some features, hey, 
height of the building, level of balconies, and some specific vertical features whilst allowing space for individual innovation. So this is by Grelin. Here we see uh, the way uh, these ideas were extended on specific squares. Here one square in the center where, where we see together this deco building and by Brion on the left this extremely uh, uh, elegant uh, ocean liner shaped uh, shape building of 1934 by Brion. Of course, the architect lives on the top floor like the uh, commander of a ship. And, and, and you see the uh, debate that was taking place at that time between uh, deco and, and early modernism. Uh, there will be more. Here you see other types of dialogues that take place in the 30s between, uh, once again, deco, uh, a building which uses horizontal stripes one can find on the Adolf Loses project for Josephine Baker. At the same time, uh, uh, bow, bay windows a la Ruspitz, and the only building, 14 story high, built in relationship to the plan to New York Eyes Casablanca, this one in 34 by Jabin. So the collection is very wide and very interesting. At the same time, these buildings use uh, very often Moroccan, steel Moroccan features in a more or less picturesque way. So here a concrete building which use a, a sort of Parisian cupola but covered with uh, uh, crafty tiles. Here a modern villa also by Jabin which uses these tiles in a more uh, innovative pattern. Uh, the use of ironwork, the use of terrazzo uh, uh, and marble in the entrances is widespread and the quality, the, the tectonic and decorative quality of these houses is extremely high. Here we see also uh, the development of the uh, a more abstract language that breaks with the early uh, accents in, uh, uh, in uh, small collective buildings. This one could be in Miami Beach or in uh, houses. Uh, in the mid-30s a new uh, language appears and here we have sometimes the illusion of seeing buildings of their recent years. This is by Marcel Desmet, a small housing building near the Casablanca station which is, as you can see here, uh, an extremely uh, abstract uh, or an extremely linear uh, uh, architecture with these uh, very beautiful uh, stairs on the outside. Uh, recent buildings in Paris have featured similar stairs without apparently any actual knowledge, but similar stairs that are dressed in this very way. Uh, we find, uh, once again, uh, patrons and architects that are willing to cooperate on extremely innovative designs during this time. After World War II, new ideas, come, new ideas appear. Uh, some young architects trained at the Ecole des Beaux-Arts return to uh, Morocco and develop for the post-war uh, uh, bourgeoisie uh, new buildings. On the left and on the right two buildings by Jean-Francois Zevaco. On the left a villa of 1947 which was a sort of extravaganza uh, uh, meant for uh, receptions essentially and which would later build for a, a, a very exhibitionist Jewish uh, money maker. Later seized by uh, 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 one of the ma ma main murderers of recent American history, General, General Ufkir, who was Hassan's the second Minister of Interior. On the right, a small airport uh, air club built by Zivaco uh, in uh, 51, still standing. This is a recent photograph, uh, which of course re reflects the fact that Zivaco was reading the issues of l'architecture d'aujourd'hui devoted to Brazil but it is extremely well done. Here we see uh, uh, new high-rises, the tallest tower in, North in all of Africa for many years, the Liberté building by Morandi, and on the left by Gaston Jobert, a new brutalist architect who had uh, also traveled a lot to America. We see one of the most spectacular small uh, multi-family houses of a period. So the range, as you can see from the uh, uh, banal modern to, to a more plastic and, 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 and daring one is extremely, uh, is extremely open. 
uh, in terms of uh, houses, in terms of uh, single family houses, we find also uh, a range that goes from California. More than ever, the second uh, post-war period is uh, devoted to a particular celebration of America. This is by an architect called Evert. And then, at the end of the 50s, in the very early 60s, of course, brutalism uh, takes, uh, takes a major place in the production of Casablanca architects. This is by Elie Azaguri, a Moroccan-born architect, his uh, own house in a, in a suburb, which, uh, uh, of course, which has a very uh, intricate and interesting interior plan and was widely published also in Europe at that time. So we see that the, the, uh, besides the uh, experiments in typology and in uh, adaptation of housing, the range of ideas developed in uh, uh, other programs was quite, uh, was quite important. We see also other topics. Casablanca is, 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 is a modern colonial city. Casablanca is created, develops together with the media, together with mass sports, and therefore the major monuments of a city are connected with, with modernization. Uh, we see, here we see two uh, 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 pieces of uh, architecture which are connected with the seashore. On the left, the municipal swimming pool, 300 meters long, which is, uh, as you can see, is connected with the sea and is a, sea wa a salt water pool, which was the largest of its kind almost, almost anywhere at that time, and which reflected this the fact that in Casablanca, Casablanca had no university, unlike Algiers, that the city in the typology of North African colonial cities was not a city of intellectuality, but a city of money and, and, and physical, uh, and money and leisure, I would say. On the right, a restaurant also by the sea from 1934, which belongs to the same remodeling policy of the seashore. But real monuments are elsewhere. The real monuments are banks sometimes, also by Boyer, one of the implemented um, uh, terrace uh, setback houses. And other monuments are, are, of course, the movie houses. Here we see the Rialto built in 19, uh, in nine, severely damaged today, built in 1930 as a theater and as a, uh, as a movie theater and, a, and as a stage with an opening roof. Here, the Lynx built in 1950, which has a very interesting entrance and ev even more interesting inside. The, the, the true monuments of the city are not the churches. There is hardly one interesting church. There are heavy churches, but certainly not interesting. There, the movie theaters are the garages. On the right, a garage from the 1930s. Uh, Auto Hall, the entrance is here. It's a Ford motor company garage, but built by French architects. There is a very spectacular Citroën garage, and the Volvo one on the right, which uh, with V-shaped uh, support, which seems to be a radio uh, set, a radio receiver on, uh, on uh, Piloti. So uh, there is a very important creativity uh, in, in, in that city also uh, at the initiative of private builders who want to occupy the stage with rather uh, uh, innovative and original and, and personalized buildings. So now, if we look at the situation of this uh, heritage today, it is rather dire. Uh, the Galerie Lafayette by Perret are gone. So is the uh, largest movie theater. Uh, as you, as you, if you follow my words, the highest building, the largest movie theater, etc., the largest swimming pool. It is interesting to see that the, semantic, uh, uh, the semantics of Casablanca are almost American. So, and, and uh, so in a way it looked as a, and, and was staged and was to some extent conceived also in that way. So both buildings are now gone for all sorts of reasons. Uh, I, it is p perhaps political paranoia on my side, but uh, in Casablanca, the uh, uh, Toro uh, area, arena, the Toro, uh, Toro Plaza has been destroyed. The major movie theater, the, uh, the only theater, the cathedral was also closed. So all the spaces where people could, could gather were 
political meetings or any kind of meetings that could become political could be held uh, are gone. And, and this is no coincidence uh, in Morocco. Um, so this, these ones are gone. Gone also is the very beautiful Benazirath house which I've shown before. We see the house here, the bathroom on the left, uh, and we see here the extravagant stairs with black granite. Uh, everything is uh, almost most uh, beautiful houses built for the French bourgeoisie or sometimes even the American Muslim bourgeoisie are gone. This is also the case of the Villa Grand which was built in the neo-Muslim style by uh, Boyer, always the same architect, for one of the wealthiest uh, French uh, uh, developers and industrialists in the city. So uh, a lot is gone. Most collective houses are left. And I will conclude uh, by one image, which is the current condition of the Candilis building. You remember the abstract Mondrian. This is the way the city looks today for all sorts of reasons, which one of which is, of course, a very uh, self-conscious uh, social policy, which is to keep the rents low in order to keep the people in place. And so um, uh, here we see, uh, in fact, that many of these uh, houses are suffering. They are still there, but, but they have suffered a lot. So what have we, what have we, what have we learned at the, at the end of this uh, story? Uh, that, uh, and what, what uh, can be told? First of all, as you can see, uh, beyond the obvious buildings that could be seen on the first day of the discovery of a city, uh, an extremely important, complex and creative process has, has taken place in terms of urbanism, in terms of, of architecture, in terms of decoration, but also in terms of the construction of uh, uh, a, a, a particular type of society. A, so a society where everybody had changed in a way. In the making of uh, Colonial Casablanca, of course, Moroccans changed, uh, Muslim or Jewish Moroccans, Berber or Ara Arabic Moroccans changed because of the new ways of life, the new technologies, the new relationship to, to, to labor and to urban life. But the Europeans change also a lot. Europeans discover more hedonistic values. They discover also and they subscribe to uh, modernity. Uh, when houses such as the one I've shown in the 50s were built, most French bourgeois were happy to build neo-picturesque uh, and regionalist houses and, and were already away from uh, any idea of building modern houses. So what we see is in fact the creation of an urban culture that believes that in a process of modernization, but an urban culture that believes in the values of, uh, of modern architecture and also in the necessity of inflecting this architecture to take into account uh, various types of uh, various ty types of cultures. In this sense, uh, I still believe that beyond beyond the fetishism of these extraordinary objects, there is still some meaning to the uh, Casablanca experiment. Thank you. No, 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 not at all. Okay, I mean, it, it seems that the American background covers so many different issues. Um, are there some questions that we could take now? Or maybe there would be some kind of moral. French did housing in uh, for Muslim people for the poor. What was the reason for the French one? Well, the reason was uh, was re first reason was development. I mean, it was not out of there was some uh, one of the components was uh, well, one of the components was sheer development. They needed to house a permanent uh, workforce when you're creating a new business and a new. Let's take one of the working class settlements uh, built for a sugar factory. At some point you need to, some industrialists thought they had to stabilize the working, the labor force and that training people and letting them go because they were 
ill-housed was not a good policy also in terms of economy. So there were efforts by uh, industrialists just to stabilize the population. Then uh, there was also the notion that the, uh, uh, the uh, that political unrest would uh, by angry and overexploited and ill-housed workers would on the, in, in the long term harm the uh, very the very uh, reality of uh, French colonial presence. I've not discussed all the details and all the political ones, uh, but uh, the fiction of, a, and to some extent the reality, uh, partial reality of the French presence in Morocco was not uh, creating a colony, but creating a protectorate, that is protecting during a, a given period of time uh, uh, the Moroccan state to allow it to grow. So they had to, to to some extent to share modernization. And the last uh, <coughs> aspect was also was uh, geared towards France and sh experimenting, training people, uh, uh, developing methods that could be of a broader use. And this is the case with, for instance, the uh, solutions of Candidis that would be later used in the 50s in France or the solutions by Ecochard that would be also used. So, uh, I mean, there was really a uh, there were a lot of <laughs> layers of, of, of reasons beyond, the, beyond the, the first one, which was simply trying to operate properly and profitably in the long term an industry. So it was clearly uh, uh, Lyoté, we have to go back to politics and ideology, Lyoté who founded the French protectorate was a completely opposed to what had happened in, in Algeria. And this is what makes Morocco interesting. Mm -hmm. In Algeria, local culture had been crushed the previous cities had been crushed. One of the first laws passed by Lyotte in Morocco is a law on historic uh, preservation. So all cities are kept. There is the notion that the city, ha that, that new cities have to be created aside uh, and that uh, colonization has to be made in a more human, quote unquote, human way. Lyotte was a social Catholic and not uh, a bloodthirsty general. So we have a, a fairly different way of, 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 of developing a country in, uh, in, in a colonial rule. Morocco was not supposedly uh, what, what has been called a, a population-oriented colony, a colony to which uh, masses of, of uh, Europeans had to be moved. Of course, there were many Europeans, but they were not supposed to completely uh, dominate the, the country. So politics play a role, and in, in this uh, politics and policies, uh, the visibility of Casablanca makes it, of course, uh, very important. I'm quite interested in the relationship with France and what was happening in Morocco. Yes. You said that it was kind of an experimental laboratory for France and that the Assad experience can be back into France. Yes. Did anything happen to Yes, yes of course. Yeah, so what, um, let's, let's ta take the example of some of the um, uh, people we've seen. Uh, most architects would stay in Morocco uh, during all their careers. People like Boyer, he would die there in 47. Uh, Perret would return to France with some of his, well, we'll not stay for long. Uh, but uh, if you, if you uh, s watch the career of the planners, for instance, Prost, works in Casablanca in Morocco from uh, 14 to 22, then uh, develops the first regional plan in France for the Côte d'Azur, for the Riviera, and then on the base of a Casablanca uh, experience he has, experience of re-articulating an, e an existing city, he works on the Paris, he's the head of the Paris regional plan uh, during uh, between 28 and 34. So he, he, he his experience and his, uh, 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 his acumen, his savvy, is used uh, in, in, in that context. The same is true for Ecochard. Uh, most uh, colonial uh, engineers, uh, uh, lawyers, etc., and even the military uh, will uh, go to France and introduce, introduce new ways, new knowledge and new ways of working. Another example, in the era of public works, uh, modern uh, technologies for our, uh, the, to, 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 to for the making of roads or um, airport uh, runways are developed with uh, American technical support 
in Casablanca, in, in, in Morocco in um, the years 45 to, to 50 and then brought, brought to France. So in a way Morocco appears for young and this is true also for young architects after 45 as a place where you can train yourself, work without bureaucratic obstacles, without red tape and then once you've acquired these modern skills uh, you return to the metropolitan country and use them. And so the network of, we were amazed also because we did an exhibition on the base of this, of the book uh, last spring in Paris. We were, we were amazed to see, we knew many people, but to, to see the impact of the uh, Moroccan the trip or the uh, uh, sojourn in Morocco in, in various layers of the uh, uh, among architects and engineers. One example is uh, are the people who work with Candelis, Woods or Ecochard they will, will later in the 60s uh, use uh, th these ideas in, do in, in working on social housing, that is in trying to understand that social housing cannot simply be a, a reduction of uh, middle class housing but has to be dealt with, if it has to be dealt in, in masses with different concepts. So anyway, the, 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 ne the network of uh, inter interference was quite uh, high and this was true not only in the relationship between Morocco and France. If you take the Italian example, for instance, uh, when Italians designed their laws and their policies for Libya in the 20s, uh, they, will, uh, they will really study uh, the French uh, uh, Moroccan experiences. This is true also of what the French themselves make at that time in Lebanon and Syria. They use the laws and regulations that had been experimented in uh, so it's a very interesting system in which, of course, there are lots of triangulations. Uh, the Americanization is one. There are a series of pa cultural patterns that travel to um, France from America uh, through Morocco. Just one last example. Um, when Americans landed in uh, Casablanca in 1942, they brought Coca-Cola with them. So when uh, the French Parliament, and this, uh, in, in the, these times, it is, of course, a very uh, uh, meaningful uh, and uh, perhaps uh, ridiculous uh, story, but uh, when in 1950 uh, the French Parliament votes on the uh, unhealthy character of Coca-Cola, there is a vote to ban Coca-Cola from France because it's considered unhealthy. At that time the French are drinking uh, an average of two liters of wine per person a <laughs> year, uh, day, sorry, <laughs> two liters. <laughs> but uh, so Coca-Cola is considered as unhealthy and it's, it is actually banned. Uh, at that time, the Coca-Cola uh, extracts are produced in Casablanca. So because <laughs> the Americans had been per there first. But that's just but a joke. France didn't do any better with milk, did he? Yeah. No, no. <laughs> Jean-Louis, I mean, fascinating story, wonderful building but I end up with a tragic, tragic feeling about the modern movement in architecture. Uh, they could experiment there. You had Atbat, you had that uh, horizontal yeah. bidonville amélioré. Yes. And what happens to it? It turns into a slum. But what we have left is buildings of character related to streets and, uh, and junctions mm. and so on. So there is a problem then about architecture and the city. Of course. Uh, the problem is also a social pro pro problem, and I will return. I'm sorry to, to I'm not usually uh, that uh, uh, centered on, on politics and social issues, but they are so obvious here. Uh, I'll just give you one example. The 8x8 uh, eight eight house was meant for a family with uh, three kids. Mm -hmm. Typical American working class families at 8 to 12. Mm -hmm. So, and, and at a certain point, uh, uh, alternative housing was not available. So they had to overbuilt they to close the patio and this is also what happened in the uh, uh, the open spaces on top of the uh, uh, walled uh, area on the uh, honeycomb building was used to add an additional room and then we, you have very difficult systems of control and but uh, people are, are, are quite happy to live in these places and the development uh, there is no board but uh, um, okay, the development of the uh, low-rise grid is extremely interesting because it became uh, a technique of social promotion for the uh, American families that were initially tenants. Then they were allowed to buy these houses and they overbuilt them. They built small three or four-story buildings and made money and were able to uh, uh, 
to rent out the uh, newly produced uh, apartments and to create a market for de facto social housing which was not existing. So the entire process, it is very interesting to see what remains of the design. I don't know, it, it, it might perhaps be, a, uh, what I would say, uh, in terms of plastic quality, mm -hmm. a nightmare. But in terms of urban life, uh, believe me, it works much better than contemporary uh, developments in other uh, cities in developing countries. Yes. In a, in, in a way, you have to go there and look at it in detail to to uh, to be more to to balance that view. But I think it still remains a very, uh, in a in a way, it's interesting because it's not extremist, it's not totalitarian. But uh, to if well, I may say so, it's not totalitarian modernism. It's really a more once again. Uh, uh, it might have become totalitarian modernism if uh, gendarme had controlled the, the building, and, 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 and but this ne never happened. Could, could, I, I mean, could I ask a question which sort of comes out of Bob? I mean, the, the first part of it really would be that in some sense, the I mean, it's a relation really about the way in which the history of modern architecture or the history of modernism is written in relation to geography. Mm -hmm. And in a sense, obviously, that history is normally told as a kind of, as having a center in Europe, sort of somewhere between France, Germany. In a triangle between Paris, uh, Zurich, uh, Dessau, uh, okay. Right. <laughs> uh, and therefore, the periphery is handled in a kind of very traditional historiographical way. Yeah. You know, it's of less importance. Yes. Uh, whatever, and and yet it seems to me, you know, uh, you tell a story um, about Casablanca, which intuitively one might pick up around a whole series of peripheral cities. It might be kind of Istanbul elements of it in the thirties. I mean, the, the, there would be a whole range. Whereas it were that traditional arrangement of center and its spread to the periphery is simply not the right story. That in some sense, at the periphery, there is a kind of more free development. And that's like the first question. In a way, it brings the second question that, that in a sense, maybe what's kind of significant uh, at the periphery is that there isn't the pressure of the resistance to modern. I mean, whatever, I mean, there might be like sheer indifference mm -hmm. or something, um, you know, but I was reading just this morning, like, the, the diaries of Victor Klemperer, where already by 35 in Germany, when he's putting in a planning permission uh, for a garage in Dresden, there is no way anyone's going to get planning permission for a garage if it has a flat roof, because that's Arabic architecture. You know, it has to have a pitched roof, because only that's German architecture, even with a, like a minor garage in the garden. And, and so, it, I mean, I mean it, it seems to me kind of what you tell, uh, at least in part, um, is one that the, the, you know, what happens on, on the periphery has a status of exemplar which is more important than is recognized in traditional historiography. And two, that might be linked in terms of the internal culture of those countries to a lack of resistance. Yes, I think uh, these are two very perceptive points. I would say that, uh, in a way, in my generation of uh, architects and historians, putting the periphery in the center is a sort of uh, mental illness, and that we share this concern, uh, this we share this attitude. It's, it has been done in other in other ways, I mean, saying, okay, the story, the, 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 uh, the main narrative has to be, um, has to be completely uh, reshaped. And, but, um, and I wouldn't say that this pattern is so widespread. 
so, but there are, if you look at the US, it is clear that uh, what is seemingly a periphery, that is Los Angeles, is one of the major centers of in, the, in the development of modernism. And it was considered as, uh, as peripheral until the, until the 60s. So it's not news, but it's true that, uh, and, and we find very, very similar reasons. People in Los Angeles perceive of themselves as being, um, as being pioneers as being shaping a new culture which is in direct relationship to nature and to a whole range of stereotypes that are not the ones of these. So we find a, pa a pattern which is supportive to, innova to, to innovation. Uh, 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 what Rainer Benham called uh, uh, an ecology sympathetic to architecture or to modern architecture uh, could be found in other places. But there are not very many of them. There, there are so, some of these places in particular conjunctures for a period of 20 years. What is interesting in the Casa and, and perhaps unique in the Casablanca uh, story is that it happens twice. It happens in the 20s and in the, in the 50s. And for reasons that are non-architectural also, money is there in the, in the 40s and 50s because people have hidden their money during the war. So you have money and uh, no destruction, so everything starts again. So I, I don't want to insist on the specificity, but uh, there is a sort of intensity level that is hard to, 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 to match. But uh, to return to your first question, I think that the, the, the problem of, if we look from a broader historical point of view, not fetishizing decades, but really looking at the broad uh, cycle of uh, modernization uh, and modernity, uh, it is clear that the, uh, that, that the simultaneity of developments is quite uh, striking and that, uh, uh, in fact, the circulation of uh, forms, ideals, and discourse was extremely intense and, and, and quick already in the 1890s uh, or in the, in, in, in the uh, years before uh, the uh, notion of an, an, an international new architecture uh, was to be constructed. But this would lead us elsewhere. Okay. It's very interesting to compare as a periphery with uh, Tel Aviv. Of course. Which is a gridded city built uh, by absolutely. English, British engineers in a military mode. Uh, but Slightly adapted by Patrick Geddes, yes. yes. Uh, yes, well, Tel Aviv is, is yet another history because Tel Aviv is, uh, yes, Tel Aviv is a to, to which patrons and architects come more or less from the same culture. So it's a particular, uh, a particular case, and it's perhaps, uh, I think it it, it has uh, other types of meanings. I would not, <laughs> I don't have any time to to build upon tonight, but it clearly belongs to the same uh, uh, with a series of cross-connection that also might be discussed. Okay? Thanks very much. Okay, well, this is a seminar for